Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at a Vixen R200SS 8-inch F4 Newtonian reflector optical tube assembly. So let's take a look. So you know, this thing's been in the catalog for a long time. You've seen me mention this in a number of other videos, and I've seen several of these in brief glimpses several times over the past 20 years or so. But this is the first time I've seen one of these close up for a long time. I've had this thing for about a month and a half now, and I've been looking through it. So you know, Vixen, I feel like I kind of have to keep being a cheerleader on their behalf. You know, it's a quality Japanese product, they're not cheap. This optical tube assembly goes for around $2,000 US at the time of filming. And yet, they're not the first name that comes to mind when you look at buying a telescope. It seems to me that they've always had some minor issues with distribution and marketing. So, you know, through the years, even me today, I'm not entirely sure which of their models are current and which ones are discontinued. And sometimes I'm not even sure where to buy this stuff. So with some instability there with their marketing and distribution, it's not surprising that Vixen has over the years partnered with people like Celestron and Orion. This one is an Orion branded version from the late 1990s. And back then you could get the optical tube coupled with a GP mount for somewhere around 15 to $1,600. Even adjusting for inflation, that's a pretty good deal even by today's standards. So I think Orion in particular has done a pretty good job at selling these things. Over the past you know, couple of decades or so, almost every one of these that I've seen has been an Orion branded version, not a Vixen version. Keep in mind, they only sold these things for a few years. Okay, so let's show you how the coma corrector works because this is a little bit different from the way you may see coma correctors today. So here's the box, it's in an Orion box, and it says coma corrector for R200SS. And again, if you have this telescope, or if you've got one, I really hope you bought this thing because it's only $69. It's an amazing deal. Coma correctors today, field flatteners can cost as much as a small telescope. So most coma correctors today go in like a two inch eyepiece, like this. But this one, leave it to Vixen, they always do things a little bit differently. So the entire visual back here comes out. And you'll see there's threads on the outside to connect to the focuser, but there's also threads on the inside. So when you take the coma corrector out, there we go, coma corrector for R200SS, circle V. The threads fit in here like this, and the focuser, it goes back on the focuser like this. So the advantage of this is it's invisible. You can't see the coma corrector. It doesn't get in the way. The disadvantage of this arrangement is that, well, if you happen to change this part, I'm not really sure how would you, you would get the coma corrector in there. So here we are in the observing field with the Vixen R200SS, all mounted and ready to go. Looks like it's going to be a terrific evening. So when you're looking for an observing location, this is typically something you want to look for. It's relatively high up, therefore the horizons are very good. You can see down to the horizon in almost all the directions, and there are no street lights for quite a ways. Having said that, this location is getting discovered. There's a housing development going in this way, not quite as dark as it used to be, although this still ranks as very good. And here we are with the Vixen R200SS mounted on an equatorial mount. I'm weighing the optical tube at around 13 pounds by itself, but outfitted with everything you see here, rings, plate, finder, and the 22 millimeter teleview panoptic, one of my favorite eyepieces. I'm weighing this rig in at about 17 pounds, just reaching into my discomfort zone for a mid-size mount like the Celestron AVX. I would be normally hesitant to put this much weight on a mount like this, but you know something? The focal length is only 800 millimeters. It's not really long like a refractor, so it's not catching the wind and oscillating. I found this rig to be quite satisfactory, something to keep in mind if you don't want to buy a really big mount. Okay, so the number one question that gets asked about this model, does the F4-F ratio have an impact on the quality of the images? 
Well, recall that the shorter the F ratio, the more difficult it is for them to achieve an accurate figure. And it gets to the point around that F5, F4 range where it's impossible to control all of the distortions, especially at the edges. So what happens is near the edges of the field of view, the stars, instead of being little pinpoints, become commas or they become little curves. And the question always comes up, how bad is this? Well, it depends on your personal tolerances and your expectations. I found aberrations with this particular F4 mirror to be outstanding, way better than I expected. So today we're used to seeing F4 mirrors from Chinese suppliers, you know, Orion, Astrotech, you know, TPO, GSO, you know, name your, name your favorite. But back then in the 1990s, early 2000s, seeing an F4 mirror was a little bit of a curiosity. People were always wondering, you know, how does this thing actually perform? So I found, you know, depending on your tolerances again, this is really good. Up to about 85% of the field of view, it's really sharp. I mean, I was much better than I expected, and you know, maybe I'm used, just used to seeing too many of those Chinese mirrors lately, but this was really, really nice. You can compensate for this partially by using the coma corrector. I didn't find it was a magic eraser. It made things a little bit better, but it doesn't seem to hurt the images. If I were you, if you had the coma corrector, I would just leave it in there. Other people have reported that if they use a Teleview Paracore, put it in there, it does clean up the edges quite a bit. I don't have one of those here, I can't attest to that, but I have had people tell me this. So how bad are those edge anomalies? You know what, this is sort of a casual telescope to me and it didn't really bother me. What I do find is when telescopes have this issue, if I'm looking for something like a small planetary nebula or a dim galaxy, you look for something that's not a star. So what happens is if you're in the general vicinity and you're looking for something and you see something in the corner that, ah, that's not a star, it's something else. And then you pan over there and when you finally move that object to the center of the field of view, uh, the comma or the comet or whatever it was, was just an edge anomaly and then it's actually sharp. So you're not actually looking at it. But then you look in the corner again and you say, ah, there's something else that's not a star and you wind up chasing your tail. That's something that's frustrating if you find objects manually the way I do. But for most people, I think this is going to be really, really nice. It's late fall as I'm filming this right now, and I just had a really good time looking at objects in the night sky with this. Uh, the ring, the dumbbell, uh, M13, the Andromeda Galaxy, M33, and a notoriously difficult object because of its low contrast shows up quite well in this. The mirror is quite nice, and the contrast, indicating a really good polish on the mirror, was good enough that I could see two spiral arms on it. Wasn't perfect, and it wasn't a terrific view, but just seeing spiral arms on M33 period, as opposed to just a hazy smudge in the eyepiece, is pretty good. Now, you don't normally think of an 8-inch F4 telescope as a good planetary scope or a good double star scope, but I found it to be really good that way also. I had no trouble looking at shadow transits on Jupiter, the moon looked fantastic, and I was even do, able to do some basic double star work. With a planetary imager inside, I was able to get these captures. This is the moon. I was able to capture this at at least a couple of phases, and one night with the planetary imager, the MC version of the ZWO ASI-120, I was able to catch this shadow transit on Jupiter. So you know, telescopes, they do have personalities. This one is just plain fun. Seeing it in the garage just made me want to take it out and say, you know what, let's just go out and see what we can see tonight with it. So again, the optics are excellent on this thing. Do I have any complaints? Well, a couple of minor ones. You know, I have a friend who says, Vixen, they're frustrating. They get 95% of the telescope right. The problem is that last 5% can drive you crazy. If you're a Vixen fan, you know what I'm about to say, the focuser. This seems to be a trait of the brand. You hear it over and over again. The focuser is good, but it is not up to the level of the rest of the telescope. You know, the action is fine on it, but the, the focus travel on it, the actual amount of travel is quite small. So, and not only that, the travel isn't calculated correctly for anything that I wanted to do with it. 
with it racked all the way out, it will not come to focus with any of my Teleview eyepieces. I'd have to get an extension tube. I've got a collection of those. I had to put it in there just to get the extension out for far enough. If I wanted to use my DSLR to take images, that won't come in far enough unless you have this special adapter. The owner of this one looked and looked for it. It's supposed to be included in the package, but he doesn't have it. We looked around online all over the world. Nobody has it in stock. So if you don't have that particular adapter, you're not going to be able to take deep sky images through this particular telescope with your DSLR. It's a shame. I really wanted to show you some deep sky images, but it wasn't to be. So again, the quality is okay. Uh, I have heard people who retrofit these with moonlights. You can do that if you like. And in fact, if you do have one of these telescopes, that's an upgrade I would definitely recommend that you do. The rest of the scope is worth it. Another minor complaint is the collimation screws in the back. You know, please give me a spring-loaded cell or at least push -pull, uh, a push-pull cell with wing nuts that I can adjust by myself. But no, they have to put these tiny little Allen keys in the back, making it hard to access. I had to touch up the collimation just a tiny bit, and it was just a pain to do that. So again, at F4, the collimation becomes very critical. Good enough isn't good enough. It's got to be right on. So if this form factor and telescope does interest you, but you don't want to spend the money, I get it. $2,000 is a lot of money to spend on an optical tube assembly. There are the Chinese clone versions that I mentioned before. I had the Orion one in here earlier, and it was okay. I've seen a bunch of these, sixes, eights, and tens. The mirrors vary quite a bit in quality, as you might expect from, you know, a Chinese supplier. You might get a good one. I've seen a couple of them that I thought were questionable. So you are taking a bit of a gamble there, but the prices on those are quite a bit lower than this, if that's your style. Ironically, those Chinese sourced versions have outstanding focusers on them. I think in my review on one of those units, I described it as an excellent focuser with a telescope that just happened to be grafted onto it. Other than that, this is a telescope I can recommend without hesitation. It is as fun or as serious as you want it to be. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.